Multivariable Calculus, section 11.5 in your Edwards and Penny text. Curves and motion in space. Now, by space, we don't necessarily mean outer space. We just mean three dimensions. You move and live and breathe in space, in 3D space. Recall from a previous lesson that we uh, showed how a vector-valued function could define a line. Your vector-valued function are the black vectors, they're variable vectors, and the equation down here at the bottom of the page is that the vector-valued function evaluated at some scalar, some real number t, is equal to the fixed vector r0 plus multiples of the vector v, which is parallel to the line. And then we talked about the uh, parametric equations for a line, which is just the combination of the uh, coefficients in front of r0 and um, v. If we put these in front of i, j, and k, this is another way to write your vector-valued function. Notice that each of the components is a linear function, and so it's not a surprise that what's drawn is a line. But they wouldn't have to be linear. The components in front of i, j, and k can be any kind of function. And then instead of getting a straight line, you get a curve. So here's an example. Let's let the first component be sine t, and the y component be cosine t, and the z component be t. So um, you might notice that x squared plus y squared is always 1. This means that the curve will look circular as far as x and y is concerned, but at the same time, the z component it just increases as t increases. So the vector-valued function, if you can imagine it, will draw circular but always moving upward. If you looked down on this curve from the top of the z-axis, it would look like a circle. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. Here's a table of values. I picked some uh, convenient um, values for t and then computed x, y, and z. So the first point in my table is 0, 1, 0, and there's a vector pointing to that point. And the second point is 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.78. There's my vector valued function pointing towards that. Then 1, 0, pi over 2, or approximately 1.57. Then 0, negative 1, pi. And then my last point in the table is back behind the screen, negative 1 on the x-axis, 0 for y, and then up. 3 pi over 2, or about 4.71. So those are just a few values of the vector-valued function. If you connect them all with a the curve, then it looks something like this. So my picture is not that great, but it'll have to do. And then, of course, that continues. So what you end up with is a spiral winding up, the, up and down the uh, z-axis, down if you use negative values for t. From Wikipedia, we see that a vector-valued function also referred to as a vector function, is a mathematical function of one or more variables whose range is a set of multidimensional vectors or infinite dimensional vectors. The input of a vector valued function could be a scalar or a vector. Now we're not going to study all these kinds of vectors, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's a better picture of a spiral. Notice that the z scale is bigger so that you can actually see the spiral. Uh, my drawing tried to do it to scale and it was not as clear. Now we're not going to study all kinds of vector valued functions so we're, we're going to be limiting our study a little bit. For example, um, we're only going to have one variable in the domain, namely t, a real number. And we're not going to have multi-dimensional or infinite dimensional uh, vectors. We're only going to be drawing and studying three-dimensional vectors, x, y, and z. And the input of our vector-valued functions will always be a scalar, in other words, a real number, t. Now, as far as limits go, these are going to be easy because uh, the definition is just to take the limit of the different components, and those will be real valued functions, and you already know how to do all that. The definition of continuity is similar. You have continuity at t equal a if and only if the limit of the vector valued function is, in fact, the same as the vector valued function evaluated at a. The derivative which has three different notations, is also easy. You just take the derivative of each of the components separately.
Now, if the curve, um, if you think of the curve as the path of a particle, then the derivative, which is also a vector, is the blue vector shown here. In other words, the velocity vector, because you're talking about um, R of t, in this case showing the path, the movement of a particle, the position of a particle, then the blue vectors are the velocity vectors. So for example, at that first point, if suddenly there was no acceleration, then the particle would follow the blue vector instead of the curve. And so our velocity vector then in this case would be the derivative of the position vector. And the speed is the length of the uh, velocity vector. Now because the uh, particle continues to curve and doesn't follow the velocity vector, then the acceleration vectors um, point in towards the concavity of the path. And so those little black vectors could represent acceleration vectors. And the acceleration vector is just the derivative of the velocity vector function. Um, there are several differential formulas listed in your book which are somewhat handy occasionally. So let's say we have two vector valued functions v and u and a real number function h of x and then let c be just a number. Then the following rules apply. The derivative is still a linear operator and so you can add two vector valued functions and then take the derivative or you can take the derivative separately and then add them. If you multiply a vector valued function by a constant, it's the same uh, to take the derivative of the whole thing or to take the derivative of the vector valued function and then multiply by the constant. And then if you're multiplying a real function times a vector function, the um, product rule applies and the product rule also applies for the dot product and the cross product. And you can find these formulas on page 854 of your text. And finally, to integrate a vector valued function, you just integrate the components separately and again you'll get a variable vector. Another way to write that notationally is big R of t is the antiderivative of little r of t and the plus c part is a constant vector and so you just add um, c with an arrow on it, not, not a number but a vector. If you have a definite integral, then you just evaluate any antiderivative at b and subtract the same antiderivative at a, and that will give you a fixed vector because you've substituted numbers. So here's number four in your book. Show that the graph of a curve with parametric equations x equal cosine t sine 4t, y equal sine t sine 4t, z equal cosine 4t, lies on the surface of this sphere. Well, the easiest way to do that is just substitute your t expression into the equation for the sphere for x, y, and z. And we multiply those out and then factor out a um, sine 4t squared out of the uh, first two terms and then we have cosine t squared plus sine t squared which equals 1 and then we have another Pythagorean identity and so it does equal 1 and that confirms the fact that these parametric equations satisfy the equation for the sphere. So then your text wants you to pick which of these um, graphs is in fact the one that matches this equation and pretty obviously the only one that shows a curve on a sphere is the first one. Number six, given vector um, valued function r of t, evaluate r prime and r double prime at t equal two. So for r prime, we just take the derivatives of t squared and t cubed and throw a two in and evaluate it. And for the second derivative, we take the derivative of r prime, derivative of two t is two, derivative of three t squared is six t, and then put a two in for t. Problem number 16, given position vector r of t, compute the velocity, acceleration, and speed. So in this case our vector valued function represents the position, let's say, of a particle moving through space. 
So for the velocity, we just take the derivative, and that's fairly simple. And then for the acceleration, we take the derivative of the derivative. So the, the i term goes to 0 because the derivative of 12 is 0. Um, don't forget that you need to multiply by 2 using the chain rule. And finally, the speed is the square root of the components of the ve uh, velocity vector, each of them squared. So you have 12 squared, and then you have your 10 cosine 2t squared and your 10 sine 2t squared. And when you square that out, you get 100 times cosine 2t squared plus sine squared 2t, which is 1. So we end up with 144 for 12 squared and then 100 for the rest of it. Number 20. Evaluate the definite integral from 0 to 1 of this expression. Now your, your text is a little schizophrenic. Sometimes it puts the uh, function in front of i and j and k, and sometimes it puts it behind i, j, and k. So um, either one is fine. So the first component, we have to integrate e to the t, which is e to the t from 0 to 1, and still multiply that times i. And then um, you might have to use u substitution, but the antiderivative of negative t e to the negative t squared is positive 1 half e to the negative t squared. Um, most of you should be able to do that in your heads, but if not, you can do a little scratch work and use u substitution. Let u equal negative t squared. du is negative 2t, etc. And so then you just put in the 1 and the 0 and evaluate it. And sometimes they rewrite things in the back of the book, but uh, it's totally inconsistent. So you may just want to check and make sure yours is the same as theirs or equivalent to theirs. So you could get a common denominator there for the j's component. Number 24, given vector function u and vector function v, compute the derivative of the dot product. So we're going to use the formula of the product rule. And so there is the derivative of u times v, and then there's uh, u dotted with the derivative of v. And so each of those two are going to have three terms. So we're going to end up with six terms altogether and we're just multiplying them term by term. Then notice that some things cancel, and that's a perfectly fine answer. Notice that it's not a vector. Remember, the dot product of a vector of vectors is not a vector. It's a real number, and in this case, it's a variable real number because t's in it. So you can leave it like this, or you can factor cosine 2t out of those two terms, and then factor 3t squared e to the negative 3t out of those two terms, and perhaps that looks a little better. Number 30. Find vector valued function r given the acceleration function vector valued function. So we're going to have to integrate backwards twice and we're going to need some initial condition. So here's the original position at time 0 and the original velocity at time 0. So for the velocity we integrate component wise and notice we have constants, so we go back up and say, OK, that first component when t equals 0 has to be th um, 0, because 0 is the x component of the velocity, initial velocity vector. So we put 0 in for t and set that equal to 0 and solve for c1. Likewise, negative 5t plus c2 has to equal 4, the y component of the velocity vector at t equals 0. And finally, when we put 0 in to the um, z component, we have to end up with negative 5, and therefore c3 is negative 5. So we put those values back in and take the antiderivative again to get position. And again, we have constants, but we use r0, that first uh, vector up there, to evaluate b1, b2, and b3. And that's our answer. Number 50, a bomb is dropped from a helicopter hovering at a height of 800 meters. A projectile is fired from a gun located 800 meters west of the spot directly below the helicopter. The projectile is supposed to intercept the bomb at a height of 400 meters. If the projectile is fired at the same time as the bomb is dropped, what must its initial velocity and angle of inclination be? Okay, so here's a picture. We have our helicopter 800 meters off the ground. We have our gun 
800 meters west and um, there's the projectile is going to be fired along that blue line blue curve and needs to hit the bomb at exactly 400 meters so here's my diagram again and let's call the uh, spot where the gun is the origin and the effect of gravity is going to be that the acceleration due to gravity measured in meters is negative 9.8 meters per second per second and when we integrate backwards from that we get velocity and when we integrate backwards from that we get position so the effect on the position um, due to gravity is going to be negative 4.9 t squared so the vector valued function for the bomb is that it's always at 800 i the x coordinate is always 800 and the y coordinate is going to be 800 minus the effect of gravity and we want that y coordinate uh, to be 400 when the projectile reaches the bomb and explodes it so we need to solve the y component equal to 400 for t and that'll be the time at which the projectile and the bomb meet the green vector represents the vector valued function for the projectile and it has two components along the x-axis and the y-axis now the x component is just going to be the initial velocity times the cosine of the initial angle times t but the y component is going to be the sine of theta times the initial velocity and t minus the effects of gravity because that's going to be changed as it moves along Now we want the x component to be 800 and the y component to be 400 and I put the time in when we want that to happen. And so if you take that second um, e equation and notice that the 4.9's cancel and move the 400 over then we have v0 cosine times the time and V0 sine times the time both equaling 800 and therefore the sine and the cosine have to be equal and we now know that the angle of inclination is 45 degrees meanwhile we can use either of the two equations I chose the first one to solve for the initial velocity by filling in the cosine of 45 degrees and then solving for V0 so our final answer is the projectile's initial velocity is about 125 meters per second and its initial angle is 45 degrees. And now it's your turn to work some problems.